Hello, hi everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle D'Amico and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Public Programs at the NYU School Professional Studies Center for Global Affairs, or CGA. Since its founding, our goal at CGA has been to prepare global citizens to make a positive impact in the world. We do this through our two graduate programs, one in global affairs and another in global security, conflict, and cybercrime. We also offer a wide variety of skills and knowledge-based continuing education courses and offer public events such as this that expand upon the topics covered in our classrooms. We are also very proud to be home to the George H. Heyman Program for Philanthropy and Fundraising. Through our professionally oriented continuing education options, the Heyman Program has long been a resource for those looking to enter or grow within the fundraising field. Courses are taught by practitioner faculty who bring their vast experience, expertise, and networks to the classroom. In addition to our long-standing certificate in fundraising, I'm very excited today to announce the launch of our certificate in digital fundraising, whose esteemed faculty you will hear from today. We'll send out a follow-up message to all attendees, so please feel free to reach out with any questions you may have. And we've also reserved some time at the end of today's conversations for Q&A from the audience, so please feel free to submit that via the tool. And now I'd like to turn this over to Elizabeth Nganzi, Adjunct Assistant Professor at the Heyman Program and Faculty Developer for the new Certificate in Digital Fundraising. The virtual floor is all yours, Liz. Thank you so very much, Michelle. Um, I would love to take this opportunity to th sincerely thank you, Dean Vera Yelenek, and our Academic Director, uh, Carolyn Kassan, for this great opportunity. Greetings, everyone. I'm Liz Nganzi, as Michelle said, and I'm the moderator for today's digital fundraising webinar and the faculty program developer of our new certificate, which we're officially launching, as Michelle said, with this event. Over 400 people registered for this webinar. Thank you to all of you for joining us from New York, Washington, DC, around the US, and even as far as Barcelona, Spain, Johannesburg, South Africa, Delhi, and of course, Delhi, uh, India, and those of you who will be viewing this recording later, uh, thank you for joining us from your corner of the world. In addition to moderating today's webinar, I'm an adjunct assistant professor here, as Michelle said, uh, and I teach um, the course that's pretty popular. It's called uh, Digital Storytelling, Innovation and Fundraising. And some of you know me from that course or my earlier course, which is online and mobile fundraising. Having been on our faculty for over 10 years advocating for nonprofit organizations to improve the, their digital engagement with their supporters, I'm so thrilled to introduce this timely certificate program and webinar, which the COVID-19 pandemic catalyzed by increasing our adoption of virtual learning, work, and socializing, encouraging a shift towards increased online giving and communications. This is an exciting trend because digital fundraising enables nonprofit organizations to in inspire, engage, and catalyze new and existing supporters. According to the Blackbot Institute's 2020 charitable giving report, which tracks $40 billion in giving, over the last three years, growth in overall philanthropic giving has only been 5%, whereas online giving has grown by an incredible 32%. Yeah, I said it, 32%. In that context, organizations clearly need to craft compelling stories and content and develop thoughtful and data-driven strategies for, delivery, for delivering messaging to the right audience on the right platform. I can't wait for you to meet the faculty we have hand-selected to join me in sharing best practices, strategies, platforms, tools, and techniques to inspire and activate your stakeholders, which include donors, funders, program beneficiaries, and other partners. Our goal is that upon completing our program, you will be able to apply the skills, knowledge, and network you will gain from our faculty members to a broad range of nonprofit organizations, foundations, and social enterprises to increase their impact. Our faculty are experienced and celebrated leaders who are passionate about sharing their knowledge with others, as they will do today. We're fortunate to have them with us uh, for this webinar, during which they will share their best practices uh, to boost your organization's fundraising campaigns this year um, and moving forward. These fantastic colleagues 
are Cheryl Gentry, with whom I will team teach virtual events and fundraising because she's too busy to teach a whole course on her own. Boris Kievsky, who will teach the course about high impact websites. Uh, Kathleen Murphy Toms will cover social media and email fundraising. Um, and Dane Wiseman, who teaches social media marketing analytics, analytics. Now I ask that each of them introduces themselves to you, beginning with Cheryl, followed by Dane, Kathleen, and Boris. Uh, just for your reference, Ki Shashe, our new Associate Director of Programs, please welcome her, is going to share um, each of their LinkedIn profiles and links to their courses in the chat. Cheryl? Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, just hearing all of this again has just uh, energized me and made me so exciting. This is going to be a really great course. I'm Cheryl Gentry, the CEO and founder at Glow Global Events. I founded the organization 23 years ago on May 1st, 1998. And this has been a wonderful continuation. And this course is culminating in everything that I've learned over the last 23 years. Some of our clients include the United Way of New York City, Housing Works, the Africa America Institute, which that event launches during UN General Assembly Week and, and coming up in September, the Omidyar Network, Race Forward. We also work with corporations like LabCorp, Metro Plus, Alliant, FIFA, and the PGA. We plan events globally from Africa, Rwanda, and South Africa, and Hong Kong. And last year, we were ranked number 145 in Inc.'s fastest growing companies in America list. So I am so excited to be here passing my knowledge and wisdom to others to take this course. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Cheryl. Dane. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Liz. Uh, and thank you, everyone, here on the webinar today. My name is Dane Wiseman. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at CyberFunnels. We're a full service marketing agency that specializes in digital marketing and automation. The other exciting uh, work that I do is here at NYU. I've taught at NYU for a little over half a decade. I started teaching uh, web analytics, search marketing, and have since focused here on social media analytics. Very excited to be here today to uh, connect with you and uh, share this information about this exciting new program with you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dane. We're really thrilled to have you with us. Okay. And uh, Kathleen, you want to go next or Boris? Kathleen, go ahead. I'm off. Thanks, Liz. Uh, I'm Kat Murphy Toms. Uh, my day job is the digital director uh, of strategy for Giving Tuesday which as you may know, is the largest philanthropic social movement of all time. I am beyond thrilled to be a part of this faculty and a part of this launch for this new program. 10 years ago, Giving Tuesday was among some of the first viral social media hashtags. Uh, and just this past year, folks who participated in Giving Tuesday gave over $2.5 billion to nonprofits in the US in just 24 hours. It smashed records. It blows my mind every time I say it. And just instills the thing that Liz said just a minute ago that digital fundraising is here to stay. It always was. It was never going away. I was a big believer a decade ago, but now we know for sure, especially in these pandemic times. Uh, in my role at Giving Tuesday, I study all of the latest digital tools uh, and particularly their power for changing hearts and minds. I coach thousands of nonprofits from all around the world and grassroots organizations from nearly every corner of the planet uh, on ways that they can generate funds for their causes using social media um, and mobilize groundswell movements for social change. And I'm so excited to be a part of this new program and lend my knowledge and the things that I've learned over the past 10 years to you all. Thank you, Kat. So happy to have you with us from Chicago. <laughs> and Boris is with us next. Uh, before I go to Boris, what I want to mention is this wouldn't have been possible in the past because Dane is in Florida, Kat is in, 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 in um, Chicago, and here we are, the rest of us are in New York, but this enables us all to be able to really deliver this to you virtually, so I'm really excited about that. Boris, you're up next, please. 
Thanks, Liz. Hi, everybody. I am, as Liz said, Boris Kievsky. I am the chief storyteller and nerd for good at .org Strategy, which is a nonprofit digital strategy consultancy. And I'm on a mission to help nonprofits harness the power of storytelling and technology to reach beyond barriers, connect with people, inspire them to become heroes for their cause, and create a better world for all of us. A uh, little bit of background about me and why I do what I do. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn in the 1980s, and with a name like Boris, I had a lot of friends, if two is considered a lot. Um, one of them introduced me to comic books where stories transported me to realities where kids who were different could become superheroes. And the other introduced me to computers, which I began programming at the age of 10, falling in love with how technology could empower us to share ideas and create communities where people didn't know my name or even how old I was. I stayed on that path halfway through college when I came back to storytelling, switching focus from computers to theater and film to explore the power of storytelling on stage and screen to move hearts and change minds. After over a decade of writing, directing, and playing the occasional Russian bad guy on TV, I chose to channel my passions for technology and storytelling towards making a difference in the world. And I was very fortunate to start my first job in nonprofits with the Milken Family Foundation. Since then, I've gone on to work with Met Council, UJA Federation, the Greater uh, Jewish Federation of Los Angeles, the New York City Children's Theater, many others, helping them create more heroes for their cause through websites, digital media, marketing, and fundraising. And now I am extremely excited because teaching is one of my biggest passions, and NYU is one of my favorite schools ever that I get to teach the uh, class on web design for impact this uh, in this wonderful program that Liz created. Thank you. Um, and it's great to be working with all of you again. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of working with Dane yet, but I'm looking forward to, but all of these other folks have either spoken in my course or we've been able to collaborate in other ways. So it's really wonderful to have you with us. And Dane, I can't wait to take your course. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, jump right into it and to talk about what you came here to hear about. So when we think about best practices and strategies and tips, um, you know, what typically comes to mind is what we, what we should do. However, experience has taught me that knowing what to stop doing and or completely avoid is just as important, especially as we navigate life during a pandemic, which has changed how we inspire, activate, and engage our supporters. As such, I would like each of our speakers to share their thoughts about what we and our organizations should stop doing or avoid this year. Forrest, let's begin with you, followed by Kat, Dane, and Cheryl. And for folks um, in the audience, please feel free to go ahead and share your questions in the Q&A area. And please take lots of notes because there's a lot of nuggets you're going to get from these folks. Thanks, Liz. So sticking to uh, the area of expertise that I'm focusing on here with, with web design, um, the biggest pitfalls that I see still to this day are making donation processes too complicated. And that could either be because there are just too many steps going to different websites, activating PayPal, jumping off back and forth, losing people and losing people's confidence. And also it might be even just overwhelming people with too many options. Oh, donate this much or donate this much or donate this much, do it this way, this way. Uh, we, uh, our brains can only handle so many options at a time. And once there is overwhelm, we just shut down and decide, oh, I'll walk away and, and, and maybe come back to it later and never do. The other big thing that uh, is a pet peeve of mine is not following up with a great thank you. That is so critical to establishing a real relationship with a new donor or maintaining a relationship with a re uh, repeat donor. You can't replace that opportunity. Yeah, so uh, good manners are really important in the digital world as much as they are in the real world. So I'm with you with that 100%. Um, so thank you for sharing that one. Who wants, who's gonna go next? It's Kat. I think it's me. Um, my pro tip for what not to do don't wing something that should not be winged. Uh, second, what, seconding what Boris just said, you really need to have a strong call to act campaign. And that takes time to strategize and focus and figure out what exactly that is and should be. Uh, I see it time and time again with Tuesday campaigns and coming to me two weeks before to ask for their procrastinator tips. And while I have those, their possibilities, uh, your best bet is to start 
months ahead of time thinking and strategizing about who your target audiences are, how you're going to reach them, and how to create the most compelling content to uh, drive those folks to action. Yeah, I'm with you 100% on that. It was kind of a do slash don't, I guess. Do you think this is, so is this now a good time for folks to start thinking about Giving Tuesday? Absolutely. If you haven't already, you need to start yesterday. So in other words, you're late. You're late. <laughs> okay, good enough. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for that, Dane. And building on what's been said, the um, one of the common things that's often overlooked is the analytics component. So having a framework in which you're able to take a look and say, this is the user experience that someone is going down. Are they completing the steps? In a, and you can set up a funnel and follow it through from a point of someone hitting a website, interacting with those stages that Boris mentioned and see what are the completion rates from step to step to step to step. And it's, it's knowing those metrics and setting up dashboards so they're always top of mind, they're always front and center, and you're always looking at, are we achieving our goals and objectives? And if someone's asking a question, do we have an answer at our fingertips? And that's where analytics today really comes in. We have such powerful tools and believe it or not, free tools that are out there and at our fingertips to really tap into these data sets that can really validate a successful campaign and to the other speakers, uh, to Kat and to Boris's point, improve UI, and then also validate your campaign. So you're able to package it up, have it ready for next year and say, you know, here's what worked. Let's continue in this path in this direction versus uh, winging it, which is uh, never advisable. Right. And as I always tell my students, don't do what you can't measure. There's no point in doing it, right? So you need to be able to measure. So this Dane is definitely the person who has the pulse on it. And you've actually taught me about a couple of new um, tools that I didn't even know about that we could use to, to, to measure. So thank you for that, Cheryl. Absolutely. Thank you, Liz. You know, technology is going to be a part of any gathering in the foreseeable future. And what you don't want to do is treat your attendees like second class citizens. You have to think of yourself. We've planned over 150 events since last March, and we really had to think about the engagement, how we were going to start, start online, right? So Yes. These were online, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, 150 virtual events since last March. Um, and we really have to think about and really talk to the client about their goals. But, you know, there's something that's even as simple as do you want to see everybody on screen? Do you not want to see everybody on screen? And I know Zoom started off with everyone using Zoom and that platform did great and they've grown. However, there's other platforms as event planners. We started doing comparisons. Who was going to offer us the best experience? But planning a virtual event is also like producing a TV show. And so a part of that engagement is having a countdown clock. What are your attendees going to see before the show start? Is there a pre-show? Do you need to produce more content? We convinced a lot of our clients to do monthly series events. And so they were realizing that they didn't have enough content. They would do annual galas, and that would be their biggest fundraising tool. But then as we started looking at everyone on pause and not being able to get out, we needed to provide them and provide the attendees with additional content. So most of our clients, we did the monthly series. Then when we did the gala, we were able to include some of that content within that. And so going back and thinking about your attendees, how can you engage? How can they network? Are they just chatting? Are they face-to-face? -face? Where can we pull in other components of your attendee pool? The sponsors, what are their opportunities? The exhibitors, are people going into a room? Uh, there's one platform we use and it's random networking. So people like that for five minutes, you just get popped in a room with someone randomly. We'll talk about technology a little bit, but you don't wanna keep your going back to uh, that first piece. You don't wanna treat your attendees like second class citizens. Give them something to watch, something to do, some place different to go. Really think about the goals of the event and go from there. Absolutely. No, I, I agree with you. And I love the fact you said, don't treat them like second class citizens, right? Because you're creating an experience. People are there with you. You really want to make them feel special. And it does just because it's virtual doesn't mean you have to really, you know, miss out on that. Um, and so we're a little ahead. And I, I saw I had a peek at the questions. And folks want to know from you guys, 
what are, you know, for the smaller organizations that just don't have the budgets or that don't have the staff to be able to really look at a lot of different platforms or to implement a lot of things, what are some of the things they can avoid? It's just very quick, quick wins they can get, um, you know, as they navigate this. I think I'd say um, don't do focus on your donation page. Uh, yeah. that should be, if, you, if you're a low capacity organization and that should be the thing that you're starting. Like Boris said a minute ago, that needs to be streamlined and as few stops as possible so that once you capture that donor, they're likely to stay there. Absolutely. Dane? I was going to mention some of the free tools out there that I alluded to before were uh, some of those are Google Analytics is free. You can use yeah. Google Sites, which is actually a free website builder that you can host your domain or actually host your website on Google entirely free of charge. So between Google Sites, Google Analytics, YouTube, uh, there's a plethora of Google tools that are completely free for uh, those without a budget to effectively reach their audience. Another one out there is if you do have a physical location, your Google My Business page is that uh, Google is putting a lot of investment into have been for quite some time on the local side. So claiming your brick and mortar, using that to post photos, post content, and also um, a late, the latest feature is tracking phone calls to your brick and mortar. You can also help attribute some of your efforts to inbound calls as well as web-based activity. The other thing is a lot of these, sorry, Boris, did you wanna go? I saw your hand. Uh, it's okay, I'll wait for you, Cheryl, go ahead. Um, a lot of the platforms also have nonprofit discounts. So um, if you want to look at comparisons, of course, it's time consuming sometimes to really just look at what your needs are. But there are a lot of comparative sites. Uh, we put together a whole host of comparisons because every client needs something different. Um, but there are nonprofit rates out there. The other thing is if you do have content, uh, YouTube has now added a donation button. Facebook has added a donation button. So as I said before, technology is going to be a part of any of your gathering. I'm going to specifically speak to events because that's what we do. Um, but companies are growing every step of the way. You know, Zoom just raised an, another round. Uh, Hop in, we use a lot, just raised $450 million. And what these technology companies are doing is making sure they're listening to the users. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be scared to call them, find out if they have a nonprofit rate. Uh, feel free to reach out to me as an agency. Sometimes we're able to pass our savings and cost on to uh, the nonprofit organization. So there are a whole host of ways. When we first started out, we actually sent um, a link through our Facebook groups. So be involved with groups. You can find a lot of information in there of what people are using. You know, it really is networking. And so how you employ those tactics, uh, there are a whole host of ways to do that now. That's wonderful. Um, the best practices document that you shared with us earlier, would that be helpful to, for us to address that? Yes, yes. So I, okay. um, I'll, I'll share that link. We did best okay. practices for planning a virtual event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Let's go ahead to back, back to Boris. I just want to say something that I, I know everybody's on this panel is going to agree with because we've talked about this so many times before. It's almost irrelevant. Uh, well, no. I shouldn't say that it's not at all irrelevant, but it is very much secondary. What platform or tools you're using? There are so many free tools and nonprofit discount tools that are out there that work great. Um, what's going to be key is the story you tell and how well you craft your story from beginning to end and guide people through it. So whether it's just on your donation page or from your Facebook to your landing page on your website, to your donation page, to the thank you page at the end, as long as the story is great, pulls people in and engages them, that's free. And it does take time to do it right, but that's gonna be your biggest driver of impact. Right. Absolutely. Okay, so wow, the questions are already coming in. So let's just hit them and I'll come back to mine or we just stick to the, the questions coming from the audience. So uh, folks are looking for any, in, any insights into digital uh, tools or platforms that have worked particularly well with corporate spawn supporters. So I suppose there, there are ways for you to be able to showcase those corporate supporters is what they're looking for tools or platforms that pr work particularly well with corporate supporters? Yeah, w coming from the event side, there are uh, organizations, we use Splash that quite a bit, that can build out your event site, kind of like a microsite. 
uh, they actually do give nonprofit discounts. So it really makes the content look great. It makes it pop. Um, we use classy.org. That's a fundraising tool um, that has website capabilities as well. So not only just with your donations, you can also build out a really nice microsite for your events as well. Uh, we love Hopin um, because that has really given attendees, it's almost kind of like an environment. And so we've used that quite a bit. You can build out, you know, if they're sponsors, you know, what are the sponsor deliverables? What are they asking? So even building out a really good uh, sponsorship deck, do they get their uh, image on the screen? Do they get the virtual backgrounds behind the speakers like we have? You know, this space has really changed. It's going to change. Digital presence is going to be here for events. And honestly, I don't think because if, if it wasn't for the pandemic, I don't even know if the events industry would have gotten here on this digital technology space. And so um, there are a whole host of opportunities that you can offer your, your sponsors. They can be on the homepage. They can provide video content, commercials, can be interwoven through your program. They can do the appeal if you're a nonprofit and, and trying to raise money. So you can re look at your sponsorship deck, look at new ways that it can be incorporated into digital links that go up in the chat. Um, you know, people can click links using that chat feature. So there are a whole host of ways to uh, incorporate that. Fantastic. Um, okay, let me let me go to the next question that came. What do you think about um, streaming across multiple platforms at the same time? Good, bad, essential? Essential. Go ahead, Kat. Essential. Uh, I see no reason why you wouldn't. It's easy to do. It's cheap to do. Sometimes it's free to do if you can find the right platform. Um, you have audience. If you have already built audiences on all of these social channels, uh, why not serve that content to everybody uh, there? who wants to stay on their preferred platform of choice. Um, I'm an Instagram person. That's my personal preference. I like to view things on Instagram. So I hope that my favorite nonprofits uh, live stream their content there. Others prefer Twitter. Others prefer LinkedIn. So the capability exists. The technology exists. It's not hard to do. In fact, it's like a press of a couple of buttons sometimes. Uh, so my answer is why not? One great platform to do that through, actually Boris is the one who turned me on to it, is StreamYard. So if you have a StreamYard account, you can actually stream to all of the different platforms and still record the video locally. So I think that's a great one. Boris, you look like you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I use StreamYard all the time, as, as you yeah. know. Um, the thing I would add to what uh, Kathleen just said, echoing everything that she said, but adding on to that, that you want to stream where you think your audience is. For example, not everybody should be streaming on Twitch unless you're trying to appeal to gamers and, and kids who are into gaming, which is totally a great avatar and audience to Exactly. If I'm going to, if you don't have an audience on your Twitch channel, don't stream to Twitch. <laughs> don't stream, stream it just for the sake of streaming it. You, you right. build your audience there first. And places where you can also come back and curate and, and, and engage with any sort of feedback that you get. There's nothing worse than someone trying to chime into a program and, and not getting any sort of feedback whatsoever. Like if you guys are asking questions today and we just completely ignore you, that you don't wanna create that feeling in your audiences either. One of the other things, and, and Dane alluded to it, you know, these platforms allow you to review analytics. Um, but what you don't wanna do, two things, a few things actually. If you are streaming and you have music in your platform, YouTube has an entire royalty-free library. So you want to make sure that you're putting any content that you're putting together, you want to make sure that you have the proper licenses. Um, but then you can also look at that analytics on the back, how many people are joining. One of the goals that we tell our clients is to, this is an opportunity to grow your audience, right? So you should be streaming to multiple platforms, but you should also be rehearsing because what cr makes me cringe is when you have your speakers and everyone's like, can you hear me? Wait, can you see me? Wait, let's go back. Let's go out. You're wasting crucial time. So you want to make sure you have rehearsals. When we do our Facebook and Instagram live, we actually do it probably at midnight. Um, some of my friends that have been up are like, hey, Cheryl, I see your team on. But you still, because when you go live, you're going to go live. So, but you want to pick an hour of the day where you can test it. You can let people know that you're testing it because inevitably someone's going to join, but you still want to have that rehearsal. 
Yeah, I totally, totally agree. Dane, looks like you want to come in. I was going to mention on something or mention something about what Cheryl just said on hour of day. So with analytics tools, whether it's Facebook analytics or Instagram or LinkedIn, you can look at, and even on your website as well, look at by hour of day and look at just different dimensions of your audience to see not only where are they, but when do they, right? So when yeah. does your audience access Facebook and you can create content uh, as Boris was mentioning, tell that story for different intervals throughout the day. I, I always advocate for the Cleveland Clinic's content where earlier in the day, if, so from the morning to the afternoon, it's all about fitness and all healthy lifestyle tips. And then towards the afternoon, they start transitioning into healthy eating tips. And it's just a specific formula they stick to that regardless of the time of day, when you see their content, you're like, Oh, aha, that's, uh, that's a little more relevant to this time of the day. So uh, something else to look out for. Absolutely. Okay. Wow. These questions are just there. You have these people on fire. They're excited. Uh, and also let's... I'll mention with the growth of technology, you know, Zoom now has closed captioning. So the transcript can come up. That's kind of a new feature that's been adopted over the last uh, year. Um, you can also, we have uh, quite a few clients that use ALA interpreters and so embedding them uh, within your feed as well. So there are a whole host of ways to pay attention to who your audience is and making sure that you're offering them options to attend your event. Uh, one quick point that Cheryl mentioned that's important is with your closed captioning text, if you are using video for ADA purposes, adhering to those guidelines is extremely important. So especially if someone's navigating and it could be just um, general accessibility where they can listen to uh, or watch captions on video. And that's the general guideline that I would apply to video moving forward. Absolutely. Okay. So Kat, I think this is primarily for you. Giving Tuesday seems so crowded. Um, are there any tips to stand out from the crowd? Yes, you're not trying to stand out from the crowd. That's not your goal. Your goal is to rally your supporters. Uh, yes, Giving Tuesday can also be a great way to find new supporters, but you're not doing that out in the ether. What you're doing is, is rallying your own current audience to go out for you and fundraise on your behalf so that you can reach that next tier of folks. Um, I'd encourage folks not to think about it as noise. This is, this is actually just leveraging your existing circle of supporters in a more effective way uh, than folks do sometimes. Uh, okay. I get that question a lot every day. Yeah. Well, you shared something that I'm like so excited for you to share, but let me get, let me ask my question so we can put everybody in this okay. and you're going to answer it about the calendar invite um, that I was like, oh my gosh, that's so genius to do that. So um, the question that I, 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 uh, I'm going to ask is, and it actually was going to start with you and then I'll go to Dane, Cheryl and Boris. Uh, you all are very experienced and innovative leaders and undoubtedly, like as people can see, have great best practices to share with us. So I want to hear some others that you want to share, but also what are some new and emerging trends or tools that are coming out that you really want folks to uh, think about or to know about as they're working to increase the effectiveness of their campaigns? And Kat, you have to share that calendar invite thing. I was like, wow, this is it. I'm going to do this like forever. Please, I hope you do. Yeah. Um, I don't think this is all that profound, but folks think it's <laughs> profound. I do. Uh, when you hang up from this webinar today, what I would like you to do is send all of your supporters, and you may you may send them different calendar invites for different folks. Uh, you're going to send folks a calendar invite for Giving Tuesday. You're going to send your supporters a calendar invite for Giving Tuesday, and it's going to say, give to your organization, uh, and you're going to insert your donation link right there so that they have that on their phone. I don't know about you, but if it's not on my calendar, it's not happening. And your supporters, I assure you, are the same way. They're professional people. They are busy. They need that reminder. Um, if you use something like Ad Event, you can actually trigger a, uh, a push notification to those folks' phones who sign up for that calendar invite. I think it's brilliant. I use it every year for my own purposes. I'll send folks uh, on my board, hey, uh, here's the toolkit that I would like you to use for tomorrow to send out your reminders to all of your networks about Giving Tuesday. Um, 
that's my pro tip. It's a great calendar pro tip. invite. <laughs> okay, and uh, do, Boris, do you want to go next with your pro tip? Uh, something you're excited about, or something that you do that's always just a winner? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned uh, as a as a pitfall is not having a great thank you follow up. So when someone has donated on your website, just coming back to websites, and they've completed their donation, you've got them primed, you've got them in a place where they are excited and they are supporting you. Now is a great time to take their engagement to the next level. And there's a couple of tips and, and things that I love organizations to do these days. One is put a video right on the thank you page of someone, and I did this with, with an organization that uh, helps uh, kids in education, uh, kids holding up signs saying, thank you, this is so awesome of you for helping us do, you know, uh, learn more of whatever it is that the organization is doing. So a quick hit of that uh, endorphin and dopamine from your supporters would be, from your, um, I'm sorry, from your beneficiaries would be amazing. And ask your supporters why they support it. Now, Again, there, you can give them multiple options and there are tools that'll let you do this embedded right on your website to either write a little paragraph, which you could then use as a quote, or to actually record a video right in the browser, which is a great little testimonial that you can share out, they can share out to get more people to come back and keep that cycle going. Awesome. Okay, Cheryl? My... Um... You know, I'm excited about digital, but I'll go back to and I talked about the royalty free music uh, a little while ago. Um, but then also you need to make sure that you get a speaker release form. I know a lot of people are throwing content up and they're not really thinking about the implications. You might not be able to have access or use that um, that video that you've recorded uh, for the duration because you didn't do the right thing. So making sure you have everything structured perfectly um, on the back end will help you alleviate problems on the front end. The other thing is really thinking about your pre-recorded content to your live content. Everything doesn't have to be live. Uh, we're live now today, but everything doesn't have to be live. And even if you pre-record, your audience doesn't need to know that it's pre-recorded. You can add uh, overlays uh, and it could say live on the video. You know, if this was a pre-record, we can just pop an overlay up on the top that says live. So there are a lot of ways that you can get around um, using your content and making sure that you're following your speaker schedule. People are busy, um, but really that live to pre-recorded, you want to really think about um, how to use that and when to use that. And, and when you do integrate that live um, sort of overlay, it probably means that you need to have the speaker there available for Q&A, right? So that's not deceptive in that sense. Absolutely. There, there are a lot of ways that we do it. We bring the speakers back to do Q&A. We ask them to wear the same thing. Yeah. Oftentimes we will just have suggested yeah. questions and, you know, they're pulled and, and even kind of that's run. We kind of call it our faux live Q&A. And so even that is um, uh, moderated and curated um, because you can't get to everyone's question. So there are a lot of ways that we kind of get around doing that, but then also making your production just look, you know, professional quality. Uh, iPhone, you can use to put overlays and um, oh, yeah. thirds with your speaker titles, things like that. So just really making your content look professional. Absolutely. And I've got to tell you, I'm going to share one tip. I love Canva. Canva nonprofits, Canva loves nonprofits. So go ahead and get your Canva account because it makes everything look great. Yeah, <laughs> right? You're right. So really, you're right. Yeah, exactly. So that's one way. And to you get a pro it. account if you're a nonprofit and it's completely free. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, wow. so, okay. yeah. The, the yeah. resizing images tool is probably my favorite one. You'll design something once and then you press resize and check off Twitter, LinkedIn, and that bright banner and it will automatically resize for you. It's the best time saver. Absolutely. Dane. One uh, on the Canva topic, since I love Canva too, is <laughs> that you can actually create video in Canva. So yeah. that's another major uh, benefit to it. Uh, emerging trends with analytics, check out Google Data Studio. It's a free tool from Google. I'm the uh, free tool guy, I guess. But uh, Google uh, Data Studio, it's a free tool. It is just so powerful in regards to taking different data connectors and applying it to a dashboard that you can visualize for 
your job function. So if you're reporting up to management, you can create a dashboard that tracks your activities in your line of business. If you're in management, you can track different lines of business from uh, social media efforts to advertising efforts to different channels you may have out there. And one of the key benefits there is the connectors refresh. So the data is always fresh. It's always at your fingertips and you can schedule it. So you can actually schedule email delivery. Uh, so I learned this early on that when management and executives or the board is asking questions, they usually have specific questions they ask on an ongoing basis. If you can build a dashboard around those questions and push that information to them, you have a very happy management team and a very happy board. So structuring uh, that data is very important. It's a emerging trend, the concept of dashboards, but most importantly, uh, free dashboards is, uh, is a good way of going about it too. Dane, I want to stay with you for a minute because I think it's important that, you know, people, when they, whenever you see data, people sort of zone out, right? Because it gets a little bit scary for them. But one of the things I want, I, I'd love that you mentioned that the, the, the dashboard's very important to be able to have that information at your fingertips and that it's, it's sort of custom, um, that you have custom views depending on the audience. But I, the other thing that's really important about um, analytics is that they enable you to be able to shift strategy if you need to, right? When you have a campaign, if you're running a campaign and then maybe you're, one week in and it's like a one month campaign, whatever it may be, if you have the ability to track what's going on, you're tracking the right things and things aren't, you're, you're not getting the right response. So maybe not the right the donations or um, the people are, are really not engaging, then that, that gives you the ability to change. Can you talk a little bit about that? Cause I think it's important for folks to know it's not just about the reporting, but it's also in when you're really in campaign mode. So uh, one point first, Liz, I'd like to address is the fearfulness of data and the term analytics, where culturally speaking, we immerse ourselves in it daily, right? We have our fitness trackers, we look at product reviews. It's just, we need to shift our mindset and behaviors looking at analytics as it pertains to our campaign activity versus how we may be tracking our health, right? So um, I always like the, you know, the step counter, right? Where we're always trying to beat our steps if you could compare that to a campaign, we're always trying to improve our campaign, we're improving our health, it makes it more relatable, right? And we can make data more relatable. The other thing is uh, relating it almost to a gym membership where, or any routine that is, where if you spend a few minutes per day and Google Analytics or Google Data Studio or the various tools we mentioned today, you improve your skill set and you get better at it, you get more comfortable with it, and you're more likely to form that routine. Absolutely, I agree 100%. Okay, so let's look at some of the questions that have come in. So what services or platforms would you sort of suggest for online donation processing? It's, I have depends. thoughts about that and could go on for hours on hours, but mostly the answer to that question is it depends on a lot. Um, Give Lively is one of my current favorites. It's free, entirely free, uh, really great mobile first design, which is the thing that you're looking for. Um, they have SMS donations uh, from what I understand. I'm a Give Lively fan, but there are hundreds of thousands of platforms that are out there. Uh, so it depends on what your needs are really. And it depends on where you are, because if you're yeah. in Kenya, it's in Pesa, right? I mean, it just really depends. Yep. Uh, you've got you've got Facebook. I mean, Facebook is basically one click donations, and now with with WhatsApp, that integration, you're able to also make the don. You're in some countries, you're able to make that one click donation through that platform. But I want to hear from Boris, uh, Dane, Cheryl. So if you're on, um, if you're talking about, for example, on your website, um, well basically anywhere these days. Stripe is the leading provider uh, at the moment. They're the easiest to integrate on any platform. Even things like Classy and some other uh, CRMs for nonprofits will actually ask you for your Stripe account to link to on the back end. And Stripe does have nonprofit discounts as well. So it's not the, the same fee as a for-profit. So I highly recommend those, but it really depends on what platform you're on. There's a million tools on each of them. And I do also love Give Lively. 
I think one of the things to be mindful though, too, I think Stripe is actually one of the most expensive as well. So you really want to look at processing fees, um, if they take out a percentage of the donation. And then on top of that, you're paying credit card fees. Um, and those credit card fees are going to stay pretty consistent throughout all of the merchant accounts. So you really want to make sure that none of those platforms are charging too exorbitant amounts. I know GoFundMe um, also does donations and you can get your nonprofit listed with GoFundMe. So there's even a way to do crowdsourcing for your fundraising. And then on the back end, you just have to make sure you're authorized.net or whatever your merchant account processing is. And then they're not taking out that money. So any platform that you're just paying your credit card fees really should be able to integrate without, if you're a smaller organization, especially without taking out any processing or admin fees or percentage of the donation of the donation. Just to be clear, Stripe is a credit card processor. They don't charge any additional fees for anybody. But some of the right, but some of the platforms that use them. That's I think a different story. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So beware exactly. of those platforms. Yeah. Yeah. But on your own website, like um, I when I build websites and help organizations, we create a direct Stripe account and there's no additional fees and there's discounts for nonprofits. Gotcha. One, uh, one additional resource to take a look at is uh, can, doing a search for what's referred to now as the MarTech Super Graphic. Years ago, it was the Infographic. And about half a decade ago, there were 5,000 tools on this Infographic. This Super Graphic is now close to 10,000. And they've done a great job just organizing different marketing technology tools into the Super Graphic broken out by application. It's worth checking out uh, each approach, say social media analytics, for example, there might be 300 tools out there. It's just staggering the amount of MarTech and that super graphic helps illustrate uh, the different providers and how they can be used. And then also do always do a demo. Some of the user experience on these platforms are just awful. And by the time you embed them in your website, it's like not even what you were thinking. So look at those demos, ask them to em, um, embed it into a website instead of just kind of walking you through. Uh, because it, a, look, a bad look of a page uh, can throw off your whole website. So always make sure you get the demo. Yeah, you want to remove that friction. <laughs> um, and user experience on the back end for your staff and the folks who are using us on the back end too. I've seen some that are just not <laughs> intuitive at all. Uh, and it needs to be easy for everybody. Absolutely. Um, a little hack for those organizations, the small organizations that we have that may be in other countries or even in the US. Um, if you don't necessarily have a secure website or you don't have a website at all, one way that you can um, process donations would be through like a platform, let's say in South Africa, like Get Give and Gain, or some of these online platforms that provide all that functionality. And they have a sort of a mini site they create for you. And they also have the, the, the ability, they, they provide you with the ability for people to find you, even if they don't know you're, that you exist, but they're looking to donate to an organization that does what you do. So um, a platform like, um, let's say, Global Giving is really good for that. Uh, and they also uh, put you into a pool for uh, donations you may not have actually even known about and grant opportunities. So you might want to look at those as well if you don't necessarily have a site yet that's already built, built out or, or the ability to um, integrate that payment. Because the other thing I want to tell you is if, if an organization is really small and the website doesn't look secure, I'm not giving a donation. So <laughs> I would rather you take me to a page on a site that I know and I'll make a donation there. And all right, so let's talk about millennials um, and Gen Z. So how do you target them in your fundraising, considering how the interest, their interest is low compared to older generation, according to uh, the person asking the question? I think, I think it's you a, don't target them for fundraising. I think that millennials and particularly Gen Z do not want to be targeted for fundraising. What they want is to be involved and included in the movement that you're building around your mission and around the cause that you're trying to move the needle on. So you need to get creative with them. Um, they can smell through fundraising campaigns like nobody else's business. Um, so you need to be inclusive to them in a way that's not directly asking for fundraising necessarily. So what would be a good example of that? Just find them where they are, reach them where they are. For Gen Z, that's TikTok. 
um, but come up with authentic ways for them to engage with your organization and invite them in, invite them to be a part of the cause. I've heard of organizations having really great success starting a junior board, like a junior junior board. Yeah. Uh, and teenagers, college students, they are into it. They love it. Yeah, we, 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 we've used junior boards before in the past. And um, a lot of them also need the experience for their yeah. college, for their college yeah. applications. So it's helpful for them to be involved in organizations, whether it's volunteering and, you know, with spreading the word about a campaign and or um, rallying their folks and friends to donate. Boris? Um, with all due respect to whomever asked that question, I didn't actually see who it was. Yeah, I, I don't know who it is. I'm pretty sure that statistic's been disproven. Um, it's not that millennials uh, don't care and don't want to give and are so self-absorbed. First of all, as they were younger, they were more self-absorbed. But as we all grow up, we see that the world is bigger than us. Uh, but also, to what Kathleen was saying, absolutely, they want to be involved. We all these days want to be involved. Very few people just want to give because there's so many options to give. We're inundated with the opportunity to spend our discretionary and non so discretionary income. So it's all about whom can you provide value to? And that is, as Kathleen was saying, engaging those folks and giving them a sense of community, giving them a sense of ownership over what your program is doing, making them feel like they are involved and heard and, and that what they are interested in contributing is being considered and actually implemented. The more you could get someone there's a, a phenomenon called the Ikea effect, that the more we feel like we built something, the more value we give to it. Um, it's, it's a fascinating study uh, that, <laughs> that I could go on and on about, but let people feel like they have a stake in your organization and then they will, whatever their age range or demographic is, they will be much more likely to give back. Okay, great. I agree with you 100%. Engagement is really, really important um, in everything that we do. So here's a question that, that really speaks to my heart. Um, it's about storytelling, right? Because at the end of the day, what we're doing is telling stories, whether it's through an event, it's a social media campaign, it's our website, uh, it's an event like this. It's really that we're telling stories. Uh, and that's the essence of what we're doing. The technology just facilitates doing so. So the question is, any storytelling advice for a community community nonprofit that is fundraising for a project that is not yet fully up and running. Um, so it doesn't have a nice video of the project in action, research to show impact or other show content yet. So what do you do when you're starting out like ground zero? You don't really have all the assets to share. Vision, vision, vision. Sell someone on the future and what it could possibly hold. You can use whatever tools you already do have at your, expose, at your disposal. So if you have a success record in other things, then you can point to, look, we built this, now we could do this. If you don't, then it's who already believes in you. You start, you try to gain momentum by first building up a core. Uh, if you're a startup, for example, you'll go to a friends and family seed round before you go out and actually raise money from venture capital. Similarly, who are the people that you know personally that you can convince that this is great? And then based on the fact that others have already um, given you that social proof that this is a great concept and your ability to convey the vision in that story of the world that you want to create, identify the problem and show them how you're going to solve it and then say, okay, I need your help to build the bridge. We also, sure. within starting out, and we recommend to uh, nonprofits that we work with, we used to go to the um, uh, Philanthropy News Digest. Now I think they merged and it's candid. You want to find out what foundations would fund your cause. Uh, you could start there and apply to grants um, on Candid. You can go online and find a whole host of foundations that will support your specific cause. And so, uh, like Boris mentioned, though, you have to have what impact is that going to have? So you have to forecast whatever your plan is going to be. You just can't say, hey, I'm doing this. You know, you have to list what impact it's going to have, what your organization is going to do, uh, the target audience, who is it going to help? Um, and then I would start with the, the grants and the uh, foundations that give to those causes. One additional component, if I may, is, uh, is listening. 
right? So uh, social media listening is an effective way of identifying conversations around a specific topic, and it can help shape our story based on what's going on in a local market or general environment, including an industry. So I would uh, consider that aspect of, as well of what's being said currently, who's saying it, who are those primary sources, and as Cheryl mentioned, uh, potentially approaching them, and then as Boris mentioned, starting with your early supporters and adopters to then grow to that next phase. Fantastic. Folks, I could be with you all day long, but we unfortunately only have an hour. Um, and I'm just going to ask you just like one more, just one more, like, like a lightning round, like what's one thing that you want people to do or to just really think about as they're preparing to, um, to, to deliver their end of your campaigns? Just one thing quickly. Go send that calendar invite. Boris? Uh, know whom you're speaking to and what you want to, them to do, what you're asking of them, so that it's a problem that they feel that they can solve by making a donation, and that's all packaged in a story. Perfect. Dane, oh, Cheryl, and then Dane? Yep, you always want to rehearse all of your technology using any digital platforms you want to rehearse. Perfect. Dane? Utilize your UTM codes for short. Uh, urchin tracking method. So that's appending your campaign URLs. So your analytics tool can see if you're seeing an email, what's your source, your medium, your campaign. And that's how Google Analytics and other tools will interpret when someone clicks on a link, what campaign did they click on? What source did they come from? Uh, but it's there's a free Google URL builder. You can search for it, Google URL builder, to attach that to your URLs to track those campaigns more effectively. I love it. I love it. And folks, don't leave us yet. We have a Slido uh, that we want you to fill out with us because uh, this is a virtual event. So we have a virtual uh, live um, poll that we're doing because we want to know um, what you really received from this session. Um, we're really excited. And I know we have a lot of questions that are still coming in and we're going to take them all together. And we're going to, when we do the follow-up, we're going to have some responses to you, to you, as well as in the LinkedIn event site that we created. So let me go ahead and share the Slido um, link with you. So you can either go to slido.com and then type in 497097 or else um, it'll be copied into the chat. And another way you can do it is use the QR code. So what are three takeaways you obtained from this webinar? Uh, we wanna just hear from you in terms of what landed, what really um, uh, resonated with you. Cause we, you know, we, wanted, we wanna make sure that this, this was um, of, of use to you and it was effective. And um, I'm just so grateful to these folks for sharing their nuggets. So while you're answering, I'm just gonna sort of let everybody um, I'm going to thank all of our, our, our speakers, Dane, Kathleen, Cheryl, Boris, tons of nuggets you shared. I could be with you all day long, and I can't wait to take all of your courses. And Cheryl, I'm so excited about our course together. Uh, of course, thank you to all of you who joined us today and shared your questions and our, everything that you do to make our sector and our world move forward. Um, and I really want to hear from you in terms of you know, what, what you obtained from this session. And uh, please be on the lookout for the follow-up email, which will have the recording, a link to our new certificate program in di digital funds fundraising, which will enable you to learn about the three courses that we're offering beginning in September, including digital storytelling. Um, and then please be help, stay healthy, be safe, uh, and but definitely answer these questions for us. We want to hear what the three takeaways that you receive from this. The poll is going to still be open. I'm glad to be seeing you. So saying insightful, rehearsing technology, absolutely. Don't, do not wing it. Yeah, I think everybody said, do not wing it. Millennial recruitment, StreamYard, absolutely. Um, the junior board idea, the junior board is great. Uh, Giving Tuesday calendar, I like I told you, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that for like every calendar, not for every event. Cause I think it's just, it's so smart, right? Cause I don't, if, if you don't put something in my calendar, I'm not gonna do it because it's just, a, it's not, it doesn't exist. So why not do it the other way? So I love the calendar. Cause I use it for everything. I use it for yeah. absolutely everything. Absolutely. Storytelling is key. Yeah, this is all storytelling. That's the core of everything we're doing here is we're telling a story 
that's being facilitated through um, by by, by uh, technology uh, to enable you to um, meet your objectives, to meet your um, mission. And so this is great. Keep them coming, um, and we'll absolutely include the results in the the takeaway. But thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you to uh, the CGA team for um, putting this all together and helping us to create this wonderful experience for you. And thank you for joining us uh, in this launch of the new digital uh, fundraising certificate program. We hope that we'll see you um, sometime in the fall or upcoming events that we have going on and online. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so very much for joining us. It was so wonderful to have you with us.